So honored to be a part of this time. It is Revival Weekend. And really what Revival is all about is, is getting right with God. Is getting right in your life and me getting right in my life and our church getting right with God. I love how the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, says it. He puts it like this, simply put, Revival begins by Christians getting right first and then spills over into the world. I think sometimes we can think it's revival time. And so we start thinking about people that need to be here. Let me invite this person. Let me see if these people can show up. I, I hope that they are here for this message or I hope that they'll get it. But I think what God is really trying to get is to you. And maybe if we could put the spotlight on our hearts this evening and say, all right, God, I can't worry about the person behind me. I can't worry about who's not here. I can't worry about who's to the left or to the right of me. But God, what are you saying to me tonight? And if we can get something out of that tonight, and that God would have a word for you tonight. Look at the person next to you and say, you. All right, is that everybody? If, if you got, if, hey, hey, everybody look at me and say, you. you. For me too. I, don't, I, I, I didn't fly all this time to not hear a word from God. I need to have an encounter with God tonight as well. And I believe that he's going to do just that. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to a specific book in the Bible known as Hebrews. And we're going to just look at two powerful, perfect, awesome verses of Scripture tonight. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. How many of y'all know that husbands should make their wives coffee because the Bible says that he brews? Come on, church. You can laugh a little bit with me tonight. Hebrews chapter 12. Dr. J, you can steal that from me next weekend, all right? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. If you're there, say, I'm there. Ready. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. The Lord speaks to us this evening from His Word, inspired by God for Crawford Baptist Church tonight. Come on. He says, therefore, since we are so surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Would you pray with me one more time? Heavenly Father, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus. And we ask by the power of your Holy Spirit to speak to us tonight. To calm our hearts. So that we can be still and know that we know that we know that you are God. We want to hear from you tonight. Vive us, revive us, wake us up, change us, draw us near Chop the spiritual fat off of our lives. Identify weights in our lives. Identify things that are on your radar that you want to talk about tonight. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. If I were to title my address with a title this evening, it would simply be this. Run, church, run. Maybe you've seen the awesome movie Forrest Gump before. If you haven't, that's one of your assignments for 2018 is to make sure you create some space to watch a movie. And that could be one of them. By the way, Forrest did go to Alabama. Amen? No, not, no, no amens for that, I guess. Okay. Um, and in that movie, there's this, there's this part where Jenny, his young girlfriend, they're having this conversation. These people run up to Forrest and try to bully him. And he takes off. And she has this line, right? This, this game-changing line. And she says, run, Forrest, run. As I've prayed about this moment tonight, I believe that if God would have a word for His church tonight, it would be simply this, run, church, run. In other words, there's a calling on our lives, on each one of our lives. You would be tempted to think the erroneous thought that there's just a calling on Dr. J's life, or on the pastoral team here, or the ministry team. There's calling on their lives, but not necessarily a calling on my life. Yes, my friend, there's a calling on your life. And it's a calling to run the race that God has marked out for you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. The author says these words right here. He says, therefore, 
Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay, lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run in with endurance the race that is set before us. I want to focus in on this first part. If we were to break up verse 1, which is a powerful verse, we'll just do a brief exposition of what God is speaking to us in this first verse. He starts out by saying these words right here. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. I want to first off say that that word therefore is there for a reason. That word is there to point us to something very specific. Some scholars, church, have said that Hebrews chapter 1 all the way through chapter 11 reside on this one word. That the author of Hebrews is trying to get our attention here. That word therefore is to say, everybody listen up. There. For, I've just communicated a whole lot of goodness in Hebrews chapter 1 through 11. Now, therefore, here's what I want you to know. If you're ready, say ready. Here's what he says to the church. He says, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. I remember a moment in my life a few years back. I'm a basketball player at heart. I'm like a basketball player theologian. So if I use basketball illustrations, just go there with me. Is that all right? Uh, but I remember a few years back, I was invited to a basketball game in Las Vegas. And it was actually a tryout game. And if you got selected for this game, you could potentially go to the NBA All-Star game where you would play in a game that was coached by either LeBron James or Kobe Bryant. And I was invited to go to this tryout. And I remember going to the tryout thinking, hey, there's a chance I might make the game. And so we're all here and we're playing and we're working out. And we're doing our drills and people are working hard, but they're just trying to figure it out. And all of a sudden there was this commotion in the back of the gym. These doors opened and everybody's like, what's going on back there? Why is there so much commotion back there? And out, out of this huddle of people came LeBron James and Kobe Bryant. Now, now church... You should have seen how everybody took their level of play up a whole nother notch. <laughs> like, what happened? How come you're playing hard now? People are sweating. People are intense. Come on. Let's go, guys. Let's go. And here's why I think that happened. Because it's true that we value who's in the audience. It's important to know who's there. That we value who's in the room. I remember a couple years ago, right after we launched our church, we were just a couple months old. And our church has a sending church in Las Vegas, Hope Church. And they're led by Senior Pastor Vance Pittman, who's an awesome man of God. And he's a friend of mine as well and a mentor in my life. And I just remember we launched out of Hope Church. And now we're off on our own. And I was standing at the door and I was greeting folks, giving handshakes, giving handshakes. And I gave a handshake and I looked up and there's Pastor Vance right in front of me. And he says, I'm coming to church with you today, man. And I was like, oh snap, I hope we do all right. Let me check my notes to make sure I don't say anything crazy. I'm going to skip that part. You know, worship team, get ready. You know, get that, fix that sign, right? Why do I do that? I think because we value who's in the audience. The Bible tells us this evening that there's an audience for your life. That there's a cloud of witnesses that's lives witness today. That their lives speak loudly today. That we're all called to run this race. And that there's an audience in the crowd. I want to pull up a picture on the screen really quick. And maybe this may illustrate for you what I'm talking about. Maybe you've seen a race before. Maybe you've ran in a race before. But this picture right here is just to illustrate a race. See the man in the orange shirt giving that high five? Could you just imagine, right? There's this crowd closing in on you, yeah? And you're running the race and you're doing your thing and you give a high five and then you realize, I just gave a high five to Moses. Like, whoa. And you take another step and, and there's Noah. Then you look to the side and there's Daniel who shut the mouths of lions and you, you, you keep running and there's the Apostle Paul right there. You take another step and there's Peter who walked on water. You take another step and... Oh, that, that's Ruth right there, and Naomi, and that's Esther, and, and oh man, there goes Elijah, and, and Jeremiah. And he says, since you're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race that's marked out for us. He wants you to know that 
that there's an audience that speak today. When you run past Peter who was crucified upside down for his faith. When you run past the Charles Virgin or you run past Dr. J's mentor, Adrian Rogers. And you run past people that had a profound impact on your life for the faith. And what they're saying to you today is they're saying, hey, I want to give you the baton now. What are you going to do with it? Do you sit down with it? That race wasn't for me. Do you bobble it? <laughs> Sometimes what we do is we take it and we say, hey, I'm going to pass this one to you, brother. Do we sit on it and act like we don't got it? Let me just remind us of something tonight, church. As we think about Revival Weekend. That the New Testament knows no such thing of a coasting Christianity. There's no such thing of a spectator Christianity. As if God saved us to sideline us. Or if God saved us so that we can get our perfect seat in the church. And we can get it cozy and show up and watch other people run the race. That's marked out for them. But not me. The scripture talks of a race that we're all called to run. Paul writes this to his young protege, Timothy. We see this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. As he says these words to this young church planner, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I love that Paul writes to Timothy and he says, my life is like a race. And I've been running the race that God has marked out for me. I don't have time to turn to the left. I don't have time to turn to the right. I have time to focus <coughs> in and run the race that God has marked out for me. If I were to give you some points this evening, if you're a note taker, the first point would simply be this, to run forward. To run forward. As you've got, been given the baton, and you've taken steps in your race, and now you're running the race that's marked out for you, you have this cloud of witnesses surrounding you. You have to run the race that, like you've never ran before. I want to challenge some folks in the church this evening with this question. Are you running the race? Or are you watching the race? Are you watching other people take steps out in their faith? Or are you running the race that God has marked out for you? I love how John Piper, who we just heard from on that awesome video, says it like this. He says, Hebrews 12 verse 1 is a trumpet call or the warning gun that the last laps are starting to see our life as a race to be run with passion and zeal and energy and discipline. Maybe you can take this quote. And you could use it as a grid to overlay your life. And ask yourself these questions. Do these words define me? Am I running the race with passion? Am I running the race with zeal? Am I, am I running the race with energy? Am I running the race with discipline? If your answer tonight is no, that's why you're here. Come on, right? That God in His grace would identify you and say, I love you so much that I want to check you into the game. I want to have a game-changing moment with you tonight. And I've sent my servant, Heidi Ratner, from Las Vegas, Nevada, to tell you, get in the game! Run the race that God has marked out for you. And don't run backwards, but run Forwards. Let me give you the second point that I see in these scriptures this evening as we continue to make our way through this text. The second point is to not just run forward, but to run free. To run free. The second part of Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says this. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. He emphasizes these words right here. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. I wanted to make sure I understood what the author was talking about when he says lay aside every weight. You know what weight means? Weight by definition is simply this. A heavy load. Something that we carry that has weight to it. It's heavy. It's 
on our backs. It has the temptation to slow us down. I remember as uh, I was invited to speak at a camp this past summer on UCLA's campus, I was going to be ministering to college athletes all around the country. And I remember there was a, 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 a track athlete from UNLV who wanted to go to this camp and needed a ride. And so she decided to ride with my wife, Nina, and I. And uh, I remember on the way to the camp, I just decided to ask her some questions about track. And I said, let me ask you this question. How important is it to make sure when you run your race, to run as light as possible? And she said, it's absolutely crucial. She said, it, it, it goes from my shoes that I wear to the shorts that I wear to the shirt that I wear. She said, I used to have longer hair. I decided to cut my hair because I didn't want anything to slow me down. I realized when she shared this with me that that sounds a lot like the Christian life. That God would maybe be calling some of us tonight to look at our lives and to say, what weights am I carrying that I need to lay aside? That I need to throw off? I don't know what weights are in your life, but maybe there may be something that's distracting you. Or maybe there's something that's slowing you down. And you need to identify that this weekend so that it no longer slows you down in the race that God has called you to run. I remember a couple pulled me aside in my church uh, a few months back. And this brother had just recently got baptized. His girlfriend had got baptized as well. They're growing in their walk with Jesus. And I was doing a men's group one night and this brother pulled me aside. He said, Pastor Hyden, I really got a, a question that's burdening my heart. And I said, absolutely, bro. What do, you, what do you got? How can I pray for you? How can I help you? And here's the question he had for me, church. He said, can you tell me something? Is it, is it sin for my girlfriend and I to live together? And he asked me this question. It was a serious conviction in his heart. They had been living together up to that point. Now they're growing in their walk with Jesus. And he said, I, I, I really need to know that. And here's how I answered him. I said, I really appreciate you asking that question. I, I love how God's at work in your heart. But I said, brother, you're asking the wrong question. Don't ask, is it a sin? If you have to ask, is it a sin? It's probably something you shouldn't be doing. All right, that's a disclaimer. Don't ask, is it a sin? Here's what you should ask. Does it help me run? Does it help me take steps in my walk with Jesus? Does it help me run faster than I've ran before? Does it help me be more godly? More holy, more pure, more righteous, more focused, more into what God is into. Does it help me run the race that God has called me to run or does it get in my way? If it gets in your way, here's what the apostle is telling you tonight. The, the author of this book, he's saying, throw it down. Lay it aside. Remove it from your life. He doesn't just say sin. Right as we look back at this verse, let's pull up verse 1 one more time. He says, since you're surrounded by so many men and women of God that have went before you, right? We named them. Think about your favorite Bible character of all time. And he's in the crowd. And he's saying, run the race. You have the baton. Now, I ran my race. I finished my race. What about you, Crawford Baptist Church? What about you, Walk Church? What will you do about the race that God has called you to run? He says, here's what you should do. You should identify weights that are in your life that slow you down and lay them aside. I remember I was preaching at a camp this past summer as well in Hawaii. I was invited. How about struggling for Jesus preaching in Hawaii, right? And I decided to say yes to going out there and doing that. And I remember preaching on a similar subject to this. And I had a brother pull me aside after one of the sessions. And he said, Pastor Hyden, I'm really struggling with something. Could you pray with me about something? I said, absolutely. Just tell me what you need. What's going on in your life? And he said, for the past few years in my life, every morning I'd wake up, I'd spend the first six hours of my day playing video games. <coughs> this older gentleman told me that with tears in his eyes. And he said, it's ruined my family. It's, it's, it's taking away from my spiritual walk. I struggle to read the Bible now. I struggle to pray. I struggle to go to church because I'm so consumed by the game. I play online with all these different people. Now, why do I share that story with you tonight? Because video games aren't a sin. 
But if they become a weight, they very much can be. When a good thing becomes a God thing, it becomes the wrong thing. And we need to identify what are those weights in my life. He said, you know what? I realize that me playing the game isn't sin, but I realize also it's slowing me down from being the man that I am called to be. My prayer for Crawford Baptist Church over the next two and a half days is that you would get with God, whether it's during the worship time, the preaching time, before you go to sleep, when you wake up, whenever you need to, when you can get by yourself with God and just say this question, God, what are the weights in my life? What's getting in my way? Not just sin. Right? We tend to know what the sins are. But the, the author here says, don't just lay aside sin. Lay aside sin and a whole lot of other stuff too. Whatever slows you down, whatever gets in your way. I don't know what those things look like, but it could be the music you listen to. Maybe it trips you up. Maybe it gets in your way. It could be a TV show. Sometimes I meet some folks that say, hey, every night I have to binge watch a new series on Netflix. I go through all 15 episodes in one night. How do you do that? Like that, that's crazy to me. That is a weight in my opinion. It could be. It could be. Yet it's the average believer in Christ could hardly spend five minutes in God's word. Let alone watch five episodes of God's word. Amen. It could be a weight. It could, be, it could be fantasy football. I have that in my notes. As I, as I was meeting with a few bros, they said, hey man, I'm almost getting ready to come back to church. Soon, season's almost over. <laughs> but man, I'm doing so great in my fantasy league. Though. Let me tell you about it. And I want to encourage that person. But at the same time, I want to ask, is, could, could, could it be that that's a weight in your life? Maybe it's gambling. Maybe it's betting. Maybe it's credit card debt. And maybe you say, you know what? This is the year 2018. I'm going to get out of debt. Because it's a weight in your life. Can I give you a word from God tonight? Do it! Do you need someone else to do it for you? You run the race that God has called you to run. Maybe it's an unhealthy relationship. Maybe it's abusive. Maybe it's sexually sinful and it's not supposed to be. Here's what God would speak to you tonight through his word. He'd say, that's a weight. So lay it aside so that you can run free. Have you ever seen a track athlete running a race and she's, and she's dragging a guy, like <laughs> dragging him? Not going to run very fast if the guy's running and there's this, and, and he's got a bottle in one hand, he's got something, he, he's trying to run the race, saying, strip it off, throw it aside. So you can run the race that God has called you to run. It could be pornography. It could be drunkenness. It could be hunting. Whatever that may look like for you. If it's a weight. If it distracts you from knowing God better than you've ever known Him before. Why wouldn't 2018 be the year that you got to know God better than you've ever known Him before? I've challenged myself with that question. Why not? Why, why can't I look back in, in 2019... And say, you know what? I'm even stronger in January of 19 than I, than I was in 18. Because I ran the race forward. I ran the race free. You can't slow me down, sin. Tell the enemy, not today. I'm running the race that God has called me to run. And maybe that is to a friend. That you love enough to say, hey, I got to run the race. I'm running what are you doing hiding? I'm running the race. Why did you plant a church in Las Vegas? Well, because I'm running the race. How can you not go into the nightclub tonight? I'm running the race. Next thing you may know is you might have other people running with you. Amen. What makes Jesus so attractive? That lost people follow him, righteous people follow him, weird people follow him, friendly people follow him. I think because he was running the race and he was so free. And he was going forward. He had a calling and vision on his life. And he ran the race marked out for him. Maybe a weight in your life is social media. I remember I had to identify this as a weight in my life. Here's how I knew. Because I began to check social media accounts right when I woke up. I'd wake up. Say, alright, let me see if I got notifications on Facebook. Alright, boom. Let me go to Twitter. 
Okay, boom. Let me go to Instagram. Okay, boom. Oh, I got text message. Boom. Okay, I got emails. Boom. I'm already late for whatever I need to go to at this point. There was not, not even a moment to think about what God would have to say to me in that moment. Wonder how many times I got out of bed and God sat right there like, what about me? Let me give you some statistics that startled me recently. Socialmediatoday.com says it like this. The amount of time people spend on social media is constantly increasing. Teens now spend up to nine hours a day on social platforms. Some may say that's a lot of time. That's a lot of time, right? The Telegraph, which is a popular newspaper in the UK, says it like this. The average person has five social media accounts and spends around an hour and 40 minutes browsing these networks every day. Here's why I share these statistics with you. Because when we think about revival, right, we're not here to play around. Amen? I know I'm not. I know George and I, we, we got on the plane last night at 1 a.m. And, and got a couple hours of sleep. To the glory of God, I have a three-week-year-old baby at home. Let me pull a picture up for you guys. Can I pull a picture up? I want to bring a greeting from my family to yours. Um, that's the little man right there. And that's Epap. He's uh, about to be three. That's my awesome wife. Um, I, I'm not here to play around. Can I be honest with you? I don't have an, a single moment in my, in my time, my energy, my day to waste time. No, God's called me to run the race that he's called me to run. That's why I'm here. That's why I put my yes on the table. Is this part of the race? Then let's run it. And let's go at full speed. Let's not waste time on things that don't matter. I love how D.L. Moody, the famous revivalist, once said it. He said, my greatest fear in life is succeeding at things that at the end of the day don't matter. Like what good is it to be super successful at things that don't have anything to do with eternity? As if Jesus, when you get to heaven, Jesus would say, hey, great job with the car that you bought. Right? Or, oh wow, that's a really fine looking deer you got on the wall. Not to say that th those things are negative. My point is this. If there's a weight in your life, lay it down. And if you think today, I don't got no weights, so I'm all good. There's your weight. <laughs> You're foolish. <laughs> the foolish person thinks they're right in their own eyes. The wise person heeds advice. God, give it to me. Reveal it to me. Show me more weights so I can throw more aside. I want to run faster than I've ever ran before. Maybe there's somebody in the room today and God's placed a book in your heart and you know you're supposed to write it. You've known you're supposed to write it. Can I give you a word tonight? Write the book! <laughs> Maybe you thought, you know what? I'm going to join a, a, a community group. And you've been saying that for the last five years. Join the group! Maybe you've been saying you're going to stop watching sinful things on your phone or your iPad or your screen for years now. Lay it down. Let me give you a statistic. It's going to startle you. You ready? 100% of this statistic. You ready? 100% of the people in this room will one day die. I, I bet it. I, that's, any atheist, we can argue that one, right? It's going to happen. Right? What more motivation do you need? Do you, like, it's going to happen. It's going to, I mean, Dr. J did a funeral today, right? Like, I, I, I don't know when my last moment is going to be on this earth. I better run the race that God has called me to run. I don't have any time to not do it. And neither do you. To run forward. To run free. My last point that I want to share with you is simply this. To, to run focused. To run focused. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 simply says it like this. Looking to Jesus. The founder and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him. Endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I love how R. Kent Hughes says it in his excellent commentary on Hebrews. He says, we must deliberately lift our eyes from other distracting things and focus with utter concentration on Him. 
Come on, church. Are you with me? He says, and continue doing so. This is fundamental to a life of faith and finishing the race. God calls us to run this race free. He calls us to run this race forward. Brothers and sisters, he calls us to run this race focused. Focused. I remember reading in a leadership book about this gathering that once happened with um, the, the, the top entrepreneurs in the world at the time. And two of the people that were invited to this banquet was Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. And Warren Buffett and Bill Gates at this moment in, in history were known as the two most wealthiest people on the planet. And there was a survey that was given to everybody in the room. And here was the question. What would you attribute your success to? And they had everybody fill out a card. And all the cards came in and they all had different answers. And then they were startled because there was two cards that actually had the same answer. They pulled Warren Buffett's card and Bill Gates' card. And amazingly, both their cards had the same answer. And on each card was just one word. Focus. Focus. If you could get focused on what God was calling you to do, a lot of things would change in your life. If you need a game-changing moment, which is the theme this weekend, when God steps in, He changes the game, that God is a game-changer, some of us need to change the game in our lives. What you're doing is not working. So you need a game-changing moment. We check God into the game, He changes some stuff up. Sometimes we don't like change. But change sets us free. Change will break chains in our lives if we let them to run forward and free and focused. He says it like this. He says to not just run the race, but run the race with endurance. Let me ask you this today. What if we had the endurance of a Noah? Who God put a calling on his life. His race was to build an ark. And God said, nobody's going to believe you until it starts raining. Run the race. What if we had the endurance of a Caleb? And Caleb was there following Moses. And then Moses placed the baton in Joshua's life. And Joshua had the endurance to continue the race that God had put on his life. And Caleb said, I'm going to be your partner in crime. We're going to do this For the kingdom. And then Caleb has this moment. 84 years later in Joshua chapter 14. Caleb says. I'm 84 years old now. And I'm still running the race. Today I will inherit the land that God promised me 80 years ago. What if we had the endurance of a Peter. Who who walked on water and sank in water. Who denied Jesus before the Sanhedrin and before Pontius Pilate and Herod, and then at the same moment, two months later, is there preaching the gospel in Acts chapter 2. What if we had that type of endurance, church? We don't don't have the endurance of an Esther who says, bring me before the king, and if I perish, I perish, right? What if we had the endurance of a Charles Spurgeon who said, I'm going to preach till my last breath. What if we had the endurance of a Martin Luther who said, even though I don't agree with the Catholic Church, I will grab my theses and I will nail it to the door and I'm going to be persecuted for it, but I'm going to run the race that God has called me to run. We need that type of endurance. We need the endurance of Elijah. We need the endurance of a Jeremiah. Jeremiah would be considered an unsuccessful church planner. He had a church of 23 people. That brother had endurance though. What if we had the endurance of an Isaiah? What do they say? Isaiah was cut in half, sawn in two? Talk about game changers in the Bible. What if you had the endurance of a Daniel? Throw me in the lion's den. I'll hang out with the lions. The endurance of a Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Who said, throw me in the fiery furnace. We'll hang out with Jesus. And if we perish, we'll perish. What if we had the endurance of the Apostle Paul? Who said, hey, to live is Christ. To die is gain. You do realize when I leave prison, I will just keep preaching again. Right? That that, that type of endurance. The endurance of a Stephen. In Acts chapter 7. A faithful man of God. Who walked up into the religious council of the Sanhedrin and preached the gospel. From the Old Testament to Christ himself. 
and was taken outside and stoned to death for his faith. And in his dying moment, repeated the words of Jesus, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's endurance, church. These are the people in the crowd. You think I'm going to not run the race? Like you think I'm going to let Stephen down? And I praise God that the grace upon grace that's on our lives is there that even when we do let him down, even when we do fail Jesus, that he lifts us up and he brushes us off and he says, keep running the race that God has called you to run. This time run focused. Run focused. I saw a video clip not too long ago that just sparked something in me. And again, I told you I was an athlete, so this may speak to you a little bit. It may not, but I want to invite you to watch this quick video with me of what it looks like to run focused. The 600 meter under the air had the gun of the Minnesota for the second this event a year ago. She was in the lane four. And Jordan is probably going to be your favorite. She actually won the NCAA championship in 2006 in the 800, but she only won one Big Ten championship in the two years. Three laps. In this event, 600 meters, three times around the 200 meter track here at the Fetal House. What a bold move by Fawn. She's looking very confident, and the Penn State runner is just running amazing today. She did win her heat in the 400, but ended up taking fourth overall. That's Fawn Dorr moving into the lead, the sophomore from Penn State. Dorn has been running second. Dorn had last year scored 23 points for the Golden Gophers in their Big Ten championship, so they're really relying on getting a lot of points from her this weekend. And she's just coming by the far door now with the home stretch, coming into the bell line. Whoa, whoa, whoa. falling down gets up quickly, but that's going to cost her. Lucky she wasn't injured. Her teammate just went to the front, though, so they may be able to recover from that. And Dorton is flying down the back she stretch. Is she, is, up. she is going to catch Fawn Dorr, and she may catch the leader. Wow. But she's got Fawn. This is a gutsy effort by Dorton. Because the reality is that you may trip up on the race that God's called you to run. That, that you may fall and you may stumble in the race. But the evidence of a, of, of a vibed Christian, right? If, you, if you've never been vibed, you don't need revival. You need to have an encounter with Christ tonight. You need to get to know Jesus Tonight. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to say, yes, Lord. I bow my knee to nobody except Christ. And if that's you tonight, then I would encourage you to do just that. And to just say, yes. Put my yes, yes, yes to Jesus. And on the journey, you may trip, you may slip. But isn't it good news that we have a cross? that covers our sin, that we have a Savior that rose from the grave, defeated death and hell and Satan and is interceding for us right now at the right hand of God. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16 says it like this, for the righteous falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. Maybe the message for you tonight is you just need to rise again. Maybe you feel like you've stumbled so much you don't even know where to begin. What if you began by just rising again and saying, Jesus, I need a new love relationship with you. As our worship team comes up, as we prepare to respond in this time, I want to leave you off with just one quote from a pastor named Vance Havner who said simply, this is what revival is all about. A revival is the church falling in love with Jesus Christ all over again.
And maybe that's what needs to happen in your life. Whether young, whether old, whether in between, black, white, doesn't matter your ethnicity. It just, remat just matters about Jesus tonight. And that he would maybe identify the weights in your life. Identify the sin in your life. And say, now's the time, brother, sister, for you to run the race like you've never ran before. In Jesus' name, amen.